Hello everybody, it's been a while since I've done one of these little video blog deals and I thought I'd go with something a little bit different. Um, I've been doing what I call these personal strategic plans for the last little while and one of them was to read five books in a three month span. I know for a lot of you speed readers that's like, oh big deal, whatever, I do that every week. But for me, reading was never something that was a big part of my life and but anytime it was, I felt better about myself, like reading 15 to 20 pages a night. So. I accomplished my goal, I set out, um, and I read five pretty heavy books. They were all dealing with some, you know, serious kind of self-helpy type books, whatever you want to call them, spiritual, they were a little bit like, uh, you know, they all were diverse in different ways. So I wanted to go over the five books and give you sort of my synopsis of them and see if maybe there's something that maybe in there that you might want to read. And the first book I read was a book called The Soul of Money, and I really enjoyed this book. Uh, I think it's actually specifically really good for poker players, because a lot of times when you play poker for a living, you you lose touch with reality in terms, you know, you just get these little plastic chips. There's no actual cash value, so you're like, live a crazy kind of lifestyle with your cash. Um, there was a couple really touching stories in it. One involving Mother Teresa and a very rich family who came in and they were very abrupt with her. She moved her head, you know, they were very rude. And the woman who wrote the book was there and thought, oh my God, these guys are jerks. Um, she had no compassion for them. She was angry with them. And later, uh, Mother Teresa sent her a letter and said something to the effect of, you know, you need to pray for them too. You need to have compassion for the rich because their souls are empty. Uh, and I never thought of that because I'm going to be honest with you. That's always been a sticky point for me. You know, people that are rich, I've always had, I've, I've hadn't surrounded myself with a lot of people like that. You know, people that are successful and rich because I've found or I've made the decision or I've created in my mind that, you know, they're mostly assholes, right? Um, and so I have had little compassion for those types of people. But uh, I realized in that moment that, you know, Money can be an illusion in the sense that it takes you further away from what's most important in life because you have so many more things distracting you from what's important and the ability to live that sort of lifestyle um, is much easier. So not to say that, you know, you know, cry a tear for rich people and not poor people. That's not what I'm saying at all. I'm saying is to have a, you know, cry a tear for all people. And uh, I can say that I'm probably guilty of not um, being very empathetic to the struggles of people who have uh, versus those that don't. There was also another really interesting story about the culture of beggars. In my life as a poker player, um, I've had a lot of friends uh, who have helped out with money uh, that were struggling, and I, you know, give them money whether I'd stake them, whatever the case may be, and just hope that they'd get back on their feet. Um, and this kept not happening, you know. And I realized through this one story that I was really enabling them. And it was a story uh, in Bangladesh about a culture of beggars, where the um, Parents were like taking their kids and they were mutilating them. They were cutting their arm because they'd be better beggars. So it really created this culture that that was the only way that they could survive. So all the aid, the food aid, the whatever, it wasn't working. There was just no way to fix, to help these people. The only way to let it to, to create something like that that would work for them is when you know you give them a vision for their own life that they can do it on their own because it destroyed their confidence. If you grow up and think all you can be is a beggar, you don't really have a lot of belief in yourself that you can do something more. So there was a couple people who went out there and. Um, had all these people sort of like think bigger picture and uh, they started to change the way that they viewed things. They started to, they found a lake to fish in, they found that they could export clothing and they started to have some hope. Um, so for me, I related that to friends that I have and how I threw money at problems. And at the time, it's all I knew. It was the best way to help them, I thought. But um, looking back, I realized I was enabling them because in a sense, um, you know, I was hurting their confidence. It's like, okay, they cannot survive without me. Um, I knew that from in my sake, when I, when I was a teenager, you know, if someone gave me $500, I worked like a bastard to pay them back because I'd been broke many times as a teenager. Um, but I realize now, you know, not everybody was built the same way. Um, so that doesn't work for everyone. So, so yeah, that book was really fantastic and I highly recommend Soul of Money. The next book I read was called The Eighth Habit and it didn't really relate to me so much. I feel like it's more of a book uh, designed for people that are in business, whether you're in a leadership role or you work in an office or something along those lines. It was written by Stephen Covey, who also wrote Seven Habits of Successful People or something along those lines. Um, so I think it'd be really valuable, obviously, for people that are in that um, sort of environment. For me, I got later in the book, the second half was kind of valuable. There was one tidbit in there specifically that, uh, that was really valuable in terms of how you debate or argue or discuss issues, where if you have two people on two different sides, you know, take abortion, for example, obviously a very divisive, uh, you know, kind of topic. And... Uh, sort of what they do is, is and the exercise they do is this. So person A is going to state their point, you know, whatever their point is, right? Now person B must respond by saying, here's what I'm hearing you say, okay? They have to reiterate the point back to person A um, and they can only like actually go on with their point until person A accepts it, until person A says, yes, that's the point I'm trying to make. So what happens is 
Person A is trying to deliver a message to person B. Person B finally really says, okay, this is what I'm understanding. Until he does that, he can't continue with this point. Once he's done that, he does it, and so on and so on. And they've done this, and what they found was uh, you end up spending a lot more time working on things that you have in, certain, in terms of common ground. So a divisive issue like abortion, um, clearly on both sides, nobody wants to see young babies being killed, right? Or like, you know, aborted, whatever you want to call it. So you try to focus on things that, that both sides have in common. And I thought that was a really valuable thing, especially with all the, um, you know, disagreements and arguments that you're going to have in poker because everyone has different views of what's best for the industry. And I'm very vocal. So um, I don't know. I found it was a very valuable tip. The next book I read was a book called Infinite Possibilities. And this might be a difficult read for some of you. You know, it's a little more spiritual. Um, it talks about God, but in a, it can conceptually, not necessarily, you know, based on any religion or anything along those lines. And um, I guess the biggest theme of the book is, you know, the idea behind uh, thoughts become things. And the words that you choose to use in your daily life, um, you know, you throw that out in the universe, if you will. And like I said, you have to really expand your mind to really get the gist of what this book is talking about. But for a poker example, um, Let's say, uh, you know, I'm playing a tournament on Monday and the tournament ends on Friday. Uh, and then Tuesday night, someone says, hey, you know, Tuesday night, let's go do this, this, and this. If I say, yeah, okay, well, if I get knocked out, you know, then I'll see you guys there. Well, that's a bad idea, okay? I know that if, <laughs> some of you are going to really go, nah, so, but I don't, I don't do that anymore. I actually, instead, what I'd say is I can't because I'm still going to be in the tournament because that's my plan. I don't want to set myself up for failure by saying, hey, you know, if I get knocked out, or book a flight at a time where it runs in the middle of a tournament where I'm already setting myself up for failure. So the tournament ends on Friday and I'm going to book a flight for Thursday, assuming that I'm most likely to get knocked out. I don't know. I just, I believe wholeheartedly and then sort of like what you put out there um, is, uh, you know, though I just can sound really cookie, but the universe is listening, if you will. Woo -hoo, woo! That's where you think I lost it, right? No, but really, I do believe that words are powerful and the words you choose to use um, and the thoughts that you have and the thoughts that you create in your mind become things. Uh, so if you harp on a lot of negativity or whatever is perceived negativity, then, you know, that's kind of what you create. And I know there's, a, I've never read The Secret or any of that stuff, but um, I assume there's some similar crossover type things along those lines. But uh, it's, it's a great book and it's very, very powerful if you're open to it. If you're not, if you're a skeptic, then you may, you know, you just may not be, if you're not reading it with an open mind, then you're not really going to get the best out of it that I think you could. The next book I read was a book called The Traveler's Gift, and I love this book. This was like, I couldn't put this down. It's a really short read. It's about 160 pages, and it's fiction. But uh, throughout the book, there is uh, seven key life lessons that the, um, the author learns along the way, and they're really, really powerful, uh, and they're put together in a story-like frame that's really like an easy read because it's not so heavy. You know, a lot of these books are just for like a lot of like, you know, just more, it's just much easier to read like fiction type books. So I found that to be a really fun book. I don't want to spoil it for you, so uh, but I highly recommend it. I think if you're going to read any one of these books, um, definitely check out The Traveler's Gift. And the last book I read was a book called The War of Art, not to be confused with The Art of War. Uh, this book talks about creativity and how resistance keeps people from accomplishing some of the things that uh, they want to. So it's, it's actually the first half of the book is a lot of really kind of short chapters, maybe one or two page chapters on... Um, you know, sort of uh, different types of resistance that we have in our life and ways that we sabotage ourselves. And the second part deals with, you know, how to break through and kind of own your creativity and, uh, and, so, and stuff like that. So I thought it was an interesting read. It wasn't my favorite of the five, but I definitely got a few solid nuggets out of that one. So now that I've read those five books, uh, moving on, I'm going to do it again. I'm going to read another five books in the next three months. Uh, and I've decided, you know, like I said, those five books are all really heavy that I'm going to mix it up a little bit read some things that maybe are outside my comfort zone, some things I wouldn't normally, you know, care about, um, and some fiction, because I don't read enough fiction. So the first book I've got is a book called How to Fall in Love, okay? And I saw this in the bookstore on the way back in London, and I just read the synopsis, and it's kind of cute. Let me put my glasses on for this. I've been reading it, and I'm actually enjoying it. Adam Basil and Christine Rose are thrown together late one night when Christine is crossing the Happeny Bridge in Dublin. Adam is there, poised, threatening to jump. Adam is desperate, but Christine makes a crazy deal with him. His 35th birthday is looming, and she bets him that before then she can show him that life is worth living. <laughs> Against the ticking of the clock, the two of them embark on wild escapades, grand romantic gestures, and some unlikely late-night outings. Slowly, Christine thinks Adam is starting to fall back in love with life. But is that all that's starting to happen? Question mark. 
So I'm really enjoying the book. It's fun. Um, next up, and oh boy, I might get slammed for this one, but you got, okay, just take it with a grain. So the title is very, a lot of Americans are going to hate the title. It's How Not to Be an American by a guy named Todd McEwen, who is an American who left the country in 1980 and went to Europe and has a lot of commentary to say about the state of America today. So I haven't read the book. I just read a little bit about the synopsis, which is, you know, he's got, I think, a negative view, but I'm curious to read what he has to write. Anyway, I'm going to keep these on because whatever. The third one, this was a gift from a friend of mine. I read a book called The uh, the Five Love Languages a while ago, and there's another edition called The Five Love Languages Men's Edition. Um, you know, looking for love, so kind of interesting. Thought it would be a good book to read. I enjoyed The Five Languages, The Love Languages, and found that mine are, um, I'd say words of affirmation is one of them, and the other is acts of service. And essentially what that means is, well, The Five Love Languages, people have, you know, touch, physical touch, um, as I said, words of affirmation, time spent, quality time spent. It's a big one for women, shockingly. No, not really. Um, but yeah, for me, it's acts of service, uh, words of affirmation. I think physical touch too. You know, everybody likes a good hug every once in a while. So there's that. And the next one, this one's really out of left field for me. Don't really know what to expect. Uh, it was a gift from somebody I really don't remember who, so I'm embarrassed to say. But um, I don't know. I read the outline. It seems kind of cool. It's called... The Right Way On, The Memoirs of W.H.T. Olive. And it deals with, um, like, the early 1900s and, you know, the gold strike and sort of life around there and stories about this dude who uh, was around at that time, William Henry Twehola Olive. That's his name. This is the dude right there. Get a close-up. So I'm going to read that one just because it's different, you know? I don't know. We'll see. Uh, and the last book, I had a favorite author before I actually was into reading anything. His name is Frank McCourt. He wrote a book called uh, Tiss, uh, Angel's Ashes, and Teacher Man. Not, it was actually, the first one was uh, Angel's Ashes. Um, and I really liked it, the books, all of them. I thought they were really great. So his brother, a guy named Malachi McCourt, wrote a book called A Monk Swimming. And it's got good reviews, so I figured I'd give it a shot. Um, you know, it's about a, you know Irish dude, probably drinks a lot, owns a bar, whatever. We'll see. So those are the five I'm reading. If you want to read along with me, cool. If not, you know, do your own thing, figure out your own kind of books. But I think it's good. I actually feel better about myself when I read. And um, I'm going to do it very structured. Like uh, what I do when I set out these goals is I have every day structured. I'm also doing two other ones. I'm, re I'm learning Spanish again, um, just improving on my ability to speak the language. I find it very easy because I speak uh, French, Romanian, um, English. Uh, and, you know, Latin languages are all very similar. And the other thing I'm doing is working out really hard. I'm... Um, uh, especially in November. No drinking alcohol, no bread, um, getting on a really good schedule. I'm going to do some more cardio and kind of like trim it up a little bit because I have a goal, all right, to uh, on my 40th birthday to have the best body I've ever had, right? And I'm close. I think I'm very close to sculpting out this particular body. And I'm sort of into the idea of visualization. A lot of friends I've talked to really believe it's worthwhile to have a picture of what you want it to look like. So, so this picture you're going to see here, it's, uh, you know, whatever, hashtag no homo. But uh, it's David Beckham, and, uh, you know, it's lean muscle. It's kind of what I'm looking for. So the goal here is when I'm 40 is to take a side-by-side -side with this picture and this picture, and hopefully they look similar or identical because I'd be excited about that. Um, very excited about, um, you know, how the working out is going. I really love my trainer, Tiffany Boydston. Uh, a couple pictures for you here. She's a really cool chick. We have a lot of fun when we work out. Also, my friend Christian Sanchez, we work out together, and he's about 20 pounds lighter than me shorter, about five foot six, but so strong. Oh my God. Like he lifts more than I do and everything. So it's really motivating for me to like, look at this little dude and he's crushing me. So it's great to work out with him. So I've really been enjoying that. Really been enjoying my time at home and, um, looking forward to November just being a month of the grind and also spending a lot of time, quality time with friends, catching up. And, um, I'm going to talk more about, uh, you know, my, my victory and some of the things in, in a separate video. I didn't want to make this one too long, so it's basically supposed to just be all about books. But um, yeah, guys, I'm just excited to be home. The seven-week trip was fantastic. I loved it. Um, I want to thank my good friend, Laura, for um, supporting me along the way because I was really dreading the trip. I didn't think I was going to enjoy myself, but she made sure to get me out and do stuff. We saw castles. We saw churches. We saw shows and just you know beautiful landscapes and just really got the most out of every city. We went to the Isle of Man and did everything you could possibly do there. Had a great trip in Amsterdam, four-day trip to end it off, where um, 
I had no poker responsibilities, and it's the first time I can say I took a trip to a city where I didn't have anything poker-wise to do, and we really had just a blast. You know, I did so many fun things, and no pressure, no feeling of like, okay, I got to do this interview, I got to play this tournament. It was just freedom, and we had an absolute blast, and um, it made me realize how much I actually want to in the future travel, but really travel, not be like, oh, going to Barcelona just to play a tournament. I want to go to cities and just enjoy the city and really soak them in. So in that, in this last month, I'd say that. I've gotten more out of traveling than I have in the past, well, 10 years of traveling Europe. So thankful for that. And um, yeah, I guess I'll uh, shoot another video for you guys. I'm going to keep these going because I'm home. Whatever. <laughs>